Hey everybody, welcome to Dixie Cryptid. I'm going to narrate a couple of stories by one man. They're short stories. And then I'm going to spend about an hour talking to him. And he's got dozens of stories. We cover three or four in the interview. I think you guys are going to love this. I really enjoy his stories and I love talking to him. So let's get rolling with the video. All right, here we go. couple of stories here from Dave. Here's the first one. These are all true. These are all this this man is like a story sponge. He remembers everything. He's in proximity to hear and see a lot of strange and unusual things that make for great stories. And I'm going to share two with you right now. Here's one of them. In the late 1960s and continuing through most of the 70s, there was a great influx of Haitian people into the Miami area. A youth pastor was working missions in those communities. His name was Bob. The Haitian immigrants practiced a mixture of Catholicism and traditional voodoo, so the Baptist church in South Miami sent missionaries into that community to evangelize. A close bond formed between the groups. A young man in the Haitian neighborhood who was involved in the outreach program had passed away. Bob went to the funeral along with two others in their group. The service was unusual with burning incense and other rituals. Bob spoke the French Creole language, but the people were speaking too fast for him to keep up and fully understand. There was a woman there who was dressed in white funeral clothes. Bob knew her as the boy's mother. She was inconsolable, crying and mourning the loss of her son. There were men who tried to restrain her. Maybe they were her brothers or even a husband, but they did no good in calming the woman. The service was coming to an end, and the pastor walked back to the casket to close the lid. The boy's mother, still wailing uncontrollably, broke free from the men who surrounded her, and she rushed the casket, screaming the boy's name. The crowd all stood up, and the pastor and her family rushed in behind the mother and tried their best to pull her away, but she could not let go of her son. She climbed onto the casket and began screaming to her son, Wake up! Wake up! The men held on to her and tried to pull her from the platform, but her grip on the casket was too firm. She began kicking and screaming at those trying to help her, all the while asking her son to wake up! In the scuffle, the casket fell from the platform, and down came the mother, the casket, and her son. On the floor lay her and her son, halfway laying out of the box, which was now laying on its side. The scene got very quiet, and everyone took a few steps back, when the boy woke and reached for his mother's hand and spoke these words in Creole. It's okay, Mama. I'm home now. The body of the young man slackened then back into death. The mother fainted and went slack on the floor. The crowd suddenly all ran from the building. The church was empty except for Bob, the pastor, and a couple of male family members. Bob and the other men turned the casket upright and repositioned the corpse. Bob then held the boy's wrist and checked for a pulse, but the boy was dead, cold dead. Bob left before the coffin was moved to the grave site. No one could explain the event. Bob later told me that these are just some of the things that we see in this line of work with third world cultures. Here's another story Dave sent me last week, and I thought this one was great. He says, this is about a resident at a hospital where I worked. Mr. Green was a schizophrenic, and he was medicated because of his condition. He was a harmless old man, and most of the time he went about his life in a happy stupor. But every now and then he would request paper and pencil, and he would write pages of algebraic expressions or diagrams of some device so sophisticated that I had no idea what they were. When he was finished, he would turn the papers back into us, telling us to call the boys. We had to monitor the paper closely. If we gave him five sheets, he had to return all five sheets and the pencil. 
We were then to take those sheets without reading them and place them in a manila folder and write Mr. Green on the outside and then put them in a lockbox. We were then to call a phone number on his chart instructing them that Mr. Green had something for them. Soon after the call, two men would show up and barter with Mr. Green for the package. The price was usually a trifle, a box of KFC chicken, a milkshake, or a box of snack cakes. When an agreement was reached and the transactions had been made, we opened the lot box and gave the men the envelope, and they were on their way. These guys were all business, very serious operators. The question that would end their time with us was always, have you given us everything he wrote? I once jokingly asked, what did he draw this time? With a cold look, their response was, that is classified. Mr. Green's health began to fail, and we had to transfer him to a geriatric unit, one that was more suited to his needs. Now that Mr. Green was moving, we had to call the number to inform whoever these men were about the move. That day, they arrived and searched Mr. Green's room, looking for scraps of paper he might have picked up or left behind. I guess they found something because they were not happy when they left. I had a chance to look over Mr. Green's chart before we transferred it over to the new ward. I found that when he was first admitted, which was long before I went to work there, some of the notes on expressed delusions stated that the patient believes the Department of Defense is out to kill him. The patient believes he worked for Lockheed Martin. The patient believes he worked on UFOs. The list was quite extensive. We had guys on that ward that believed they were Jesus Christ. Some thought they were the devil and everything in between. So Mr. Green's delusions were dismissed as just that, delusions, and pretty tame ones at that. But looking back now, I have to wonder, were they really delusions at all? Dave, how's everything going? Oh, it's good as it could be, I guess. Instead of me just asking you questions, and I hate to just kind of put you on the spot, Dave, but just whatever pops in your mind, I know you've had some Bigfoot encounters. Do you want to start with that? I was about 12 years old when this happened, and I got up up close and personal with that one. That was I was within touching distance of it. Well, tell us the story. And what kind of? <laughs> I want to okay, hear it. Well, basically, Dad, Pop, he was. I was born and raised in Miami, and he always wanted to get back to the country. Like I say he was raised by his uncle out there on, on the farm during the Depression, and he kind of wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle of Miami and find a piece of ground and do a little farming and stuff like that. So the 70s, he bought this little piece of ground out here. You know, we're all going to move to the country. Of course, he was still working going back and forth, so he had us out here. We were in a little single-wide trailer that he put on the property, and we didn't have, you know, a whole lot of power and stuff out here. We were kind of like camping out in this trailer. Uh, he got some, some calves. We, we built a little hay barn and stuff out there. And one night, the uh, cows are all mooing and carrying, you know, carrying on. Of course, I ain't got a flashlight or nothing, but I go out there. I think I'm in short pants and T-shirt. I go out there to see what's going on with these calves. Well, the way the barn was made, it was facing away from the moonlight. So I couldn't see into the barn. But I, I could tell there was a calf inside the barn and something laying next to it. And I thought that there was a dog or something on the calf. So here I am trying to get my eyes just to the light to see it. About that time, whatever it was, stood up. And of course, it's still inside the barn, and I'm thinking it's a man. So I'm hollering for my brother to bring a light and a gun and so forth. Well, it steps out from underneath the eave of the hay barn. And that's, that's seven foot is, is that eave in that barn. I know this because... As a kid, part of the game was to jump up and try and touch the eave. It was about seven feet tall. He had to bend over to step out of it. He was standing there. By then, I could see him fairly well in the moonlight. First thing come out of my mouth was, okay, I'm armed, you know. Don't, and and it, said, it either said this or it mind spoke it or whatever. But here I am, look at this thing. It's over seven feet tall. It's all of four or five feet wide. And his voice does not fit his body. It's like, well, come on in, in a, you know, a, a high-pitched, nasally voice that would fit, you know, right into the, the local accent here. So by now, I'm backing up, and it decides it's going gonna, it's gonna to run past me. And as it runs, it runs down this ditch line, 
and you know jumps over this four foot fence like you know like like a hurdler hops over a hurdle and it's gone. Well, I go into the barn and there's a calf and it's tied by the neck. The the it took the hay strings and it's something like tying knots. It had it like twisted and braided up. I got the calf loose and then of course Pop was away at that time. He came home the next day. Pop goes out there and looks and so forth. I'm showing him the footprints this thing left. And, you know, it's like size 22 footprint, a great big footprint. My God. He calls the law out there. The law comes out. And first thing, first thing your deputy does is he tries to convince Pop that, uh, yeah, there's one of them crazy guys out of the mental hospital that escaped. And, you know, they're mostly harmless. Don't pay it no attention. But I noticed everywhere he's seen a footprint, he took his shoe and wiped it out. Wiped over new footprints so you couldn't see them anymore. I'm pretty much convinced that whatever this thing was, this Bigfoot or whatever, it was having some kind of sexual relations with this calf. When you when you take a look at it, because I've seen other ones, they don't look like this. This one here, I don't know if he was posturing or if he was deformed or if there was something wrong with him, but his head seemed to be coming out of the center of his chest. I mean, I don't know if that's how big his, his upper body muscles were or what, but if you were to look at it, like if you just see his shadow cast on the ground, you wouldn't see a shadow of his head. You see his shoulders up above. Him. Okay. But it was just, it just odd. Now I've seen, I've seen ones after that. that You can clearly, you know, you don't see much of a neck on them, but you see their head above their shoulders, but not with this one. So I thought, well, maybe it was deformed and the other ones, you know, he couldn't find a mate. So it decided to have its way with his calf. I don't know. But that was that, that. That was the first one. That's when uh, Pop bought me a shotgun. She showed me how to shoot. He, he, you know, in his mind, it was a crazy mental patient. But I know, I know for a fact that that wasn't. Easy. I've never heard anybody talk about one that's head. I, I can see what you're talking about. Almost like an Igor posture. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. It was. I, I said I don't know if it was trying to bulk up to make it look itself much larger than it was by flexing its muscles or what, but. You know, it's like if the, if you were looking on it straight on, its chin would be like even to where its nipples would and add all that muscular over top of it. So I've I've seen I've seen one picture on the internet that kind of looks like that, to where it's all muscle above its head like that. But man, that is so that is so weird. It, it is uh, the, the the other ones I've seen. You know, you can you know just like, just like the Patty film, you you know where its head is on its body, but not not that one. So it might have been deformed. Might have been something wrong with it. Right. Well, I know you've had other encounters, but I kind of want to vary. You you have so many stories you've heard from family members and other people and people you're associated with. I kind of want to vary it up. Again, before we started, you were telling us about a guy that you knew that hunted vampires and werewolves. Do you want to talk about that or leave that out? Is 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 Okay. The, the, the same mental hospital they told me this guy escaped from. When I got grown up, I got a job out there. You know, you have all kind of craziness going on in the mental hospital. You know, you got you an idea of, of what can and does go on in a place like that. Yeah. This one guy came in, and he was a John Doe. They didn't give his name. He wouldn't give his name. In fact, I knew him for about four months every day working with him before he finally told me I could call him Tom. Young guy, well, not young. He was, he had a demeanor on him, like so, something like Denzel Washington. He was little, little, uh, a light-skinned black guy. He was probably in his 40s at that point, maybe maybe even his 50s. It's hard to tell. Very clean cut. We had a little clothing store over there where you could go and uh, the, the, the patients could go and they could get clothes. And you could tell that he was used to dressing nice. He was always, you know, like some of them guys that run around in their underwear, not him. He was always fully dressed, very, very sociable. And they didn't have him any medications of any kind. He was just there for observation. Have you ever known anybody who was like a uh, lifetime military? Yeah. How they've got this kind of way about them that you tell that he's like, you know, almost crisp turns and stuff. That's the way this guy was. After after a bit of time, I got to talking to him, and he told me that he hunted the, the paranormal, that he hunted vampires and werewolves. And that's, that, that's the reason he was admitted. He had driven a stake through a guy's heart in Tampa and had killed him, or so they thought. And when the cops come, and I guess the guy had a silent alarm that Tommy Tommy wasn't aware of, but they came in and they arrested him. Of course, he, he went without a fuss. His only thing was he kept telling him he wasn't done yet. He wasn't done yet. So they had him locked up down there in the jail, and they were going to ask prosecuting for murder. The body of the person or whatever it was that 
they thought was a person. It disappeared out of the morgue. It was gone. They, they, you know, they, they, they couldn't prosecute him for, for murder. They had no evidence. They had no body. They had nothing. They sent him down to us. That's, that's what he was telling me later about, about that. He, so he said that you, you had to cut the head off to make it official. If not, you pull that stake out, they come right back to life. I guess that's what happened. He stake. He told me, he told me the, 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 the different things that he had done. The only thing he, he told me about werewolves, because he, you know, well, to the, 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 the start the story off, he told me that he was trained by a guy in Boston to do this kind of stuff. That he has the wherewithal and the means to come and go and do his pleasing. And that he traveled up and down the eastern seaboard hunting these things. And that he made quite a few kills. He didn't say what all what all he got rid of, but you know, in his mind he was a monster killer. That's what he did. Uh he told me about about werewolves. He said that you had to kill them when they're in a human form. That the wolf was just too tough. You could you know, and I got thinking about this as you know, when people talk about the dog man and they shoot the thing 15 times and it keeps right on coming, that's what he said about a werewolf. He said, you know, bullets and stuff really have no effect on them. You got to kill them when they're human beings. I don't know. But anyways, uh, he stayed there uh, about six and a half to seven months. And like I say, he, he told me after about the fourth, fourth or fifth month, I could call him Tommy. And then a few few other people he got called Tommy. And he became real good friends with the social worker. Well, one night on night shift, this was the shift after mine, he gave a note to one of the people and told them to give it to the social worker. And they were like, well, why don't you just wait and give it to him tomorrow? And he's like, well, you, you, you do this for me. So the next morning when they do the, the the morning check, he was gone. They got no idea how he got out of the place, where he went to or what. He was just gone. And the note went to the social worker. To the, it said, I'm sorry, ma'am, duty call. That was, that was the note. I don't know how he got the notice to know when it was time for him to leave or what, but he got ready to go and just, boom, he was gone. That is fascinating. That <laughs> I have never talked to anybody like that in my life. Now, did you work at the at the hospital? Yeah, well, I worked about ten years out there. Okay, so that's how you had access to him. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm figuring you're working. I don't know carpentry work or something. And you had he was a hand on your crew or something, but you you well, actually later. Later in life, I did a lot of menial labor and different things. But at that point, I worked out there at the at the hospital. And it's amazing about, you know, when it comes to the paranormal, I believe in the physical. I believe in the angelic, and I believe in the demonic. I'm kind of a Bible literalist in that. So I don't believe that if you see a ghost that you're actually seeing the spirit of somebody that dies. But I know spots in that hospital, like there was one ward up there where a nurse had gotten killed, a, a patient that, that killed her. And on certain nights, you could see her walking up down the hallway. I don't know if that was just the psychic energy absorbed by the building or what it was, but, you know, I, I, I doubt you could carry on a conversation with her. I, I don't believe in that, but uh, you, you could see her walking up down that hallway late at night. And uh, I know a lot of times, like, with the way the units were laid out, you had, like, one set of wards on one side. And then, the, like, like usually they had male and female wards would, would share, like, a courtyard to where in the evening they could get out there and congregate a little bit. And they had these big fiberglass rocking chairs. And I've walked between wards, you know, late at night. I used to work four to midnight. And there wouldn't be a wind blowing. And them rocking chairs would be rocking like crazy. Oh, God. I don't know if it was all the disturbed minds putting out psychic energy or what it was, but it's silly stuff like that. We had a, a boy out there one time and, uh, I saw this myself and this, this, this one scared. He wasn't crazy in the, in, in, you know, as, as far as like, uh, violent or anything. In fact, most of the time he was very quiet, kept himself in the room. Well, he believed that he was possessed by a demon and one of the psychologists there decided, well, they're going to, and she, she was she was a nice lady, don't get me wrong. I mean, she went to church and everything else, but she thought that if she could convince him that she, you know, was going to exercise this demon out of him, that he, he'd get better. So one day she brings her Bible and starts to pray over him and stuff. And, oh, man, somebody who was so nice and calm, he changed real quick. He was trying to kill her. I grabbed hold of him. Now, I weigh, oh, at that time I probably weighed about 240 about six foot tall, so I was a pretty big old boy, and I grabbed him and slammed him to the ground. Two or three other guys grabbed hold of him and were trying to hold him down. Over his face, it just like you, you, you ever watch like the old uh, 
the old Wolfman movies, whenever he changed how they did that with the stop motion photography, one minute he's a man, and then like the next scene, he have a little bit of hair, the next scene, be more hair. Yeah. Looking at his face, it did the, I don't know, like, like a, a demon's face was like projected over top of his. Oh, and wow. he went to flipping us around, and I say, he, he wouldn't have weighed 120 pounds, and he was flipping us around like we weren't nothing. They finally got enough dope in him to knock him out, but, you know, there for a while, he was whooping three or four of us. I think, I think he was actually demonically possessed, and she she brought it out trying to read that Bible and stuff over it. I think that happens. Well, uh, when my pop was dying, he was dying of the cancer. He was down in, uh, in Miami, down at the cancer center, and... He was he was kind of a war hero. He was shot three times in France. Whenever it come time for him to die, he was sitting there up in his bed, and he had on a, a button down shirt, you know, short sleeve shirt. I didn't see this figure, but I did see the shirt afterwards. He said, "Death came," and you know, like like death, like you see, uh, like on uh, the Simpsons or the Family Guy, you know, the black robe and the bony hands and all that. Yeah. He, he come and, and stood on Pop's shoulder. And he said, oh, boy, I said, you escaped me. You escaped me twice. He said, but this time I'll have you. Now, I looked at his shirt after that was over with, and there was two little footprints burnt the top of his shirt. And I said, I, I didn't see the figure. I guess only only he could see the figure. It, it, it burnt them footprints on top of his shirt. I think probably the ghost thing, or I, I've never seen anything, but I felt, like the presence of other, I'll, I don't even know what to call them, entities close to me. Probably just, probably just my imagination. That's a lot closer than I've ever come to having a Bigfoot encounter. You know, and as far as encounters go, there's a lot of Bigfoot encounters, and we do them all the time on this channel. And, uh, you know, people talk about it all the time. But there are so many more paranormal type stories like you just told out there that they there's a hundred times as many of those as there are Bigfoot encrypted encounters. And we were, again, talking before we started to record and you were saying that's a huge deal that people deal with. And I'd like, I'd like to start hearing more of those, you know, we're not just locked into cryptids here. Anyway, I, that's a little bit off topic, but, but, but it is interesting. Okay. So I imagine you have even more ghost stories. You want to, you want to, you want to dig into that, Dave? Well, here the, the the road that I live on, back in the day, it used to lead down to what was in the county seat. It's no longer in the county seat, but we had a court a, a courthouse down there, and we had the hanging tree and the jail. And, you know, two 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 of the big churches were down there. Back whenever I was dating my wife, there used to be a spot about midway down that road where there was a swamp. And they had put big culverts in the swamp, and they built a road over it. There was a spot you could kind of pull over. You wouldn't be on the road, but you could pull over there. And the way the trees grew, it was like a tunnel. That was a good place to go and, you know, park park with your sweetheart late, late at night and sit and talk and so forth. So we're down there one evening, and it's probably it's probably going on. Well, we were 4 to 12 at the hospital, so it's probably going on about 1 o'clock in the morning. And we were sitting there discussing life and getting married and all that, all that stuff. And we hear, coming down the road behind us, the sound of a horse and wagon. You hear the horse neighing. You hear the flump of his feet. You hear the, the, I guess, a man and woman talking. You hear spring squeaking and a bell ringing and so forth. It comes right up to the car where we're parked and right on by us. You know, you could hear all this. And he says, I looked on the road going in front of us. All you could see of the horse and wagon was a horse's white feet clumping on the floor on the ground. You see four white feet going clump, 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 clump. So that was, I thought, I, I thought that was pretty good. She was, she was, she was ready to quit discussing and hit the road at that point. It was, the conversation was over with. And once well, she saw that, she didn't want no part of it. I was staying at a house that was supposedly haunted. They told me that there was, uh, the spirit of a little girl in there. Their, their little girl would, see this other little girl spirit or whatever and would, you know, laugh and giggle and wave at it. I know a couple of times on the answering machine, you get a message. It'd be like a child laughing and so forth. Well, it, it worked out to where, because I worked nights, I slept during the day while, you know, they were at work and, and, and their kids and stuff were at school or babysitter or whatever. 
I'm laying there and I'm sleeping real good. And I feel something like shake my toe and I ignore it. And then I feel pat on my leg and I ignore that. And then whap, I get slapped in the face. And I go and I look in the mirror and there's a little tiny handprint. Like you imagine a baby slap my face, made my face red. I thought, oh, that was kind of odd. Very. Uh, you know, we, we, we were talking about, about uh, how the psyche can play on some things. Yeah. You know, back in the 20s and 30s here in Florida, we used to have bands of gypsies. They still come today, but they don't come like they did back then. They roll into town, you know, with a horse and a wagon, and they put on a show, and they would go around, and they'd, you know, do little odd jobs, fixing pots and pans and so forth. Well, on Sunday, their thing was to, to put on a show, and they had uh, some animals and stuff. One of the animals they had was a monkey, and they had, like, you, you remember, like, the old organ grinders, the monkey, he'd tip his hat, and he'd do a backflip, and he'd yeah. hold a little tin cup. He'd oh, put yeah. coins in. Yeah. Well, he, he, he caught the people outside of church, and he would do that. He would do little flips, and he'd hold, you know, and people would drop a penny in his cup, and, you know, he'd bow like he'd done us a favor. Well, he'd watch the crowd, and for the ones that hadn't paid yet, he'd, like, go and, like, you know, tug on their pant leg, hold the cup out, like, you know, quit being cheap kind of thing. It was part of the act, and I guess that if if – uh, a guy gave him, gave him a, a penny or whatever. He shake the guy's hand. Well, this woman, she was there, and she was about a month long pregnant. And you could tell she was scared of the monkey. Just my grandmother telling the story. She, she was scared of that monkey. But she reached out and dropped the penny in the cup. Well, I guess the monkey was going to hop up on her shoulder and kiss her, I guess was the deal. You know, thank you for the penny. Don't give her. And it scared her. It scared her almost half to death. She liked to faint it and everything else. Well, fast forward seven months and the baby's born. Baby looks just like a monkey. Oh my gosh. You're kidding. My, my grandmother my grandmother said that that woman kept that baby covered up. You know, like, like she'd be out walking the baby in the carriage. She'd have a blanket over the, you know, like tint it over the baby. Didn't want nobody to see the baby. So he looked just like a monkey. Yeah. You know, she was so scared of it that it imprinted the baby or what. But I thought that that was a, 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 bit, of, a bit of oddness, you know things to happen you know i've you seen know, it, i've seen something like that before and it was in my adult life <clears throat> i bought some property in another state i actually built a building on it and ran a business out of it for 15 years but the property was way out in the in the delta and it had it, it had only just been farmed there was an old liquor store on there that had been closed down and i bought uh, the property from a woman who had inherited it from her father and she had two daughters. Now, I don't know. I'm sure it was a genetic, a chromosomal thing or something because, I, you know, I'm not familiar with those type of birth defects and handicaps and things like that. But she had two daughters, and I swear they both look like cavemen. They had, you know, have you seen the pictures of the Neanderthal-looking human face? And yeah, that's Sasquatch. Yeah, these, <laughs> right. Well, these two girls were, uh, they were twins, and they both looked identical, and they looked like, and they were very friendly. I mean, I loved them. I talked to them all the time, and, of course, they couldn't, they were older. I think they were in their 30s or 40s, and they had to live with their mother. But, you know, when you first walk up and see that, it's shocking. It's You have to really think about it not to show it when you see something like that but she walked around town with them all the time and and i never saw them before but i saw them three or four times after we made that deal on the property and i got her paid and all that stuff and it's really it was it's i have not thought of that until you just told that story that's amazing it's amazing now i'm going to think about it for another week and <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to glean from it, but that's really strange. So, yeah, the psyche does have, I mean, the way you see things and the way you absorb things and work them out in your mind has a lot to do with, uh, and there are people who will say, oh, that's that's just bull crap. It's not true and stuff like that. But there's too many, it's like Bigfoot. There's too many stories out there, and it's hard to weed through the chaff, you know, to, I think somebody said winnow out the chaff, and, and I don't even try to do that, but I just listen to the stories and I relate them to everyone because I like the story, but there's too many, 
there's too much weird stuff that people talk about through the years for some of that not to be true, don't you think? Oh, I, you know, it's, it's just like just like that that the story about the fact. Now, I saw Emmett's daughter, and she would have been, of course, I'd have been about 16 at the time, and she'd have been in her late 50s, almost 60. And they said that she got the blessing of the faith. She was, you know, the first, I guess the first three kids had the pock marks and, and the missing hair and stuff to match Emmett. By the time she come along, I guess they forgave her. But I seen her face. I don't know how to explain it. It was it was a, an ethereal beauty. She almost glowed. You know, it's like if she if she she walked into a grocery store or a public place, everybody would turn and look at her. Yeah, it was just it was just that that outstanding. I mean, there, there ain't no movie star had nothing on her, and to be as old as she was and to look at her, I mean, it was you know you didn't see you didn't see the age on her at all. I mean, it was you know almost I don't know I won't say tinker bellish, but you, you know what I mean. It's it's just. I don't know. She glowed, and I I, I I can't even explain it. It's like it's like Pop. You know, Pop's always been the, the center of attention. Whenever he went anywhere, he had a good sense of humor, and he wasn't. You know, he, he's a pretty good look fellow. Right. And there, I, you know, when I seen her walk up, Pop's jaw hanging open. I know that he saw it too. He's like, <laughs> you know, what is this? This angel come down from heaven, kind of thing. <laughs> and here's another thing. I like, for instance, the Fay. I got a lot of comments on that. Uh, video and I can't. I'm. Tr- I get so many. Of, I'm trying to think. But uh, here's what I'm trying to get at. People will lock, for instance, you know, a story about fairies. For, for example, they'll lock them into something they read, and they can't. They can't see it any other way. Or they'll see Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Or they'll, you know, or uh, you know, like a banshee. Or and they lock them into one. They have one vision of what these things can be. But the truth is, for example, the Fae can take on all kinds of all kinds of uh, physical appearances. Wouldn't you do you agree with that? I mean, like people lock themselves into what they think Bigfoot looks like. But I think the descriptions that we get across the at least across North America, your description when we first started was Totally different than anything I've ever seen, and I don't doubt for a minute what you saw. But that was a different looking, you know, Carrie Arnold. He he describes one. Matter of fact, the one he described sounds like the one you described. It was real wide and and you know had real big, you know, those big neck muscles and what do you call those shoulder muscles next to your neck? Anyway, those kind of muscles. So and then you hear people like I got the guy who told me the story while he was duck hunting that I wrote recently. He said hit the one he saw was tall and lanky. So, I mean, I think they take on all kind of different forms. And what do you think about Bigfoot? Do you think he's a physical flesh and blood beast? I want to say yes. I mean, looking at it, looking at it biblically, there's 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 only two things I see Bigfoot as being. He's either a descendant of the Neph or he's Esau, one of the two. You know, in the Bible, when they Bible, they, they talk about Esau, about him being a man of the forest and a hairy man. And, of course, Jacob and them, when they say it, you know, there's there's no surprise in it. It's like that was an everyday occurrence. Oh, I'm a smooth man, but my brother, he's a hairy man. It's like, that's something that happened every day back then. I don't know. Maybe they were just a different branch of humanity that popped up every, you know, blue moon or what the deal was. But I do know that they can do things. It, with the speed and the ability that they move, you know, it, it almost seems supernatural. I'm not going to say it's supernatural, but they're so in tune with their environment. It's like I've I seen one walking across the Palmetto field. Yeah, do you, 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 you're familiar with Palmettos, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, you you know as well as I do, there's, there's you need to do a clump of Palmettos. You and I couldn't go through there with, you know, with a machete. It'd take us half an hour to move 20 feet. That's right. And I've seen these things go through them like they're gliding, like they're on a 10-speed bicycle going full out. Boom, right on through there. And they, they don't bob, they don't trip, they don't weave, they just right on through there. So it's like, is it is it that, are they that in tune with it? And they're that fast and that agile to where it makes it look supernatural? You know, I know people talk about cloaking and all that other stuff. Now, I, so, so something I do believe, because I, I, do, I do believe in the demonic. I believe if you go out there looking for Bigfoot or whatever it is you're looking at, and you don't have a clear, crisp idea in your mind of what that is. You know, Bigfoot, he's the greatest hide-and-seek player there is. He don't want to be seen, but there's plenty of things out there that do. I know guys here here local that have, you know, they, they spend a lot of their time in, in the green swamp. They go hunting for Bigfoot, and they do pretty good. 
But for every one time they see a Bigfoot, there'll be three or four times they'll see a shadow man. Are, are, are you familiar with the shadow man? No. Basically, a shadow man is, it's a shadow that walks and moves. It's, it's a, a three-dimensional shadow. It's a dark entity. I, I saw one on one occasion uh, walking across the back of my property. To look at it, it looked just like you know, an old man with a cowboy hat. Of course, it's all dark and in shadow, but you can watch him move. You know, he moved from, in fact, my, it was my daughter who had seen him, called me the window watching, and he just walked and ambled along, and then just, when he got a certain part, he just disappeared. I've got a friend, he's a, he was a highway patrolman at that time. He saw one in his in his uh, kid's bedroom, and he pulled a gun on it. It walked right through the wall and disappeared. Now, here, here's a guy that his, his whole thing is about observation. And he told me, he said, Dave, you know, God's my witness. That's what this thing was. It was a walking shadow. But uh, we were talking before about, the way the, the the way things can seem, the way things you know are are, are different for everybody that sees them. Yes. You know, I guess it was, it was right after Thanksgiving, and I've got some neighbors down here. They uh they raise uh, Barbados sheep. I don't know if you ever seen a Barbados sheep or not, but no. they aren't woolly like like in white sheep are. They're kind of a long hairy. They look like a long stringy haired goat. Is what they look like. But he had about ten of them, and he got up one morning. and They were all dead. Well, people around here know that I'm into that kind of thing. So one of his neighbors asked me, I go down there and take a look. So I go down there and I'm taking a look. I'm trying to talk to him. Now, he's a Spanish fellow. I didn't know him. All the time we're talking, he's acting like he don't understand English. I looked at the animals. They were all killed with a single blow to the left side of their neck. The hole that it left, uh, you've seen people that, like the ice climbers, they got that little pick they use to climb the ice with. Yeah. If you walked up and smacked the, 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 the sheep in the side of the neck, that's what the hole looked like. We've got a lot of sugar sand down here, so it's not great on tracks. So the little pen they had the, the, the sheep in was probably 50 by 50. Them walking around in that pen at night, they done wore away most of the grass. And there was one spot there where they had an old metal tub, like a bathtub out of a house is what they were using for a watering trough. And they had it plugged up, but it leaked. There was some water there. The, the, the ground was wet enough to leave a track you could actually make out. I looked at that track, and that track was a lizard's track. It was it had the elongated, I guess they call it the second distal phalange, or if you looked at your hand, it'd be your ring finger. It's elongated and the lizard track. Right. I, I seen it. It was probably probably six inches, not not including that toe. If you include the, include that long toe, it's probably about about eight inches. So. Look, I, I didn't see I didn't see any trails for any, any tails or anything. So I went. I, I told him. I said, "Well, I know this isn't a dog attack. This isn't a big cat attack." I said, "I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna get up some casting material, cast this track. I'm gonna, you know, shave the neck of the thing so we get a good look at this stuff." So I, I left. I was gone about an hour, hour and a half trying to get my stuff together, and I went back down there. Of course, by then, and I had asked him. Of course, it was, it was hard to communicate because he act, you know, he acted like he didn't understand me, but. You know, was any kind of noise made or, you know, they, they didn't hear nothing. They didn't see nothing. They got up and, you know, the sheep were dead. Yep. So by the time I got back down there, the cops are in the yard. And he, he done pointed to, he had a neighbor over there. So he's about, I don't know, about 50, 55 years old. And he's gay and he's pretty flamboyant about it. And, you know, he'd holler out and he'd, you know, be, be out in the front yard like in a, Daisy Dukes and stuff, hollering at guys <laughs> driving by, that kind of thing. So the 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 whole neighborhood didn't like him anyway. And he had some dogs. I mean, I know these dogs. These dogs are they're more of a nuisance than anything. I mean, they're they'll tear up your trash. They'll pull your clothes down off the clothesline, that kind of thing. But they weren't vicious animals. But by the time I get back down there, the cops are there, and animal control are there, and they picked up the the two two of the dogs that belonged to that fellow. And, he done changed the story now. Oh, yeah, he's seen the dogs do it and all like that. He wouldn't let me go in there and catch. Uh, he, he wouldn't let me examine the bodies after that. So I went down there, too, whenever they was actually having the, the court case. This would have been, oh, toward the end of January. It actually went to court. I just want well, to see what they were going to say. But I was going to tell the judge, hey, I, I looked at their bodies. That was not a dog attack. That was that single point. And something else about that puncture wound that kind of got me thinking. You, you, you've cut your hand, cut your finger before, and you wash it in the in the sink, and you get, like, the, the watered-down blood, kind of that runny, pinkish look. Yeah. That's what the little bit of blood on the animal's neck looked like. And there wasn't no blood on the ground. 
Now, I've butchered a lot of hogs. I've done a lot of hunting. You know, when you stick an animal, it bleeds. Even in the sugar sand, you could tell where an animal bled out. There wasn't much blood around these. And the, I said, what blood was on them, it looked watered down. So whatever it was that got them, it used some kind of anticoagulant, which got me thinking, too. I mean, you've got 10 sheep. Uh, that's that's a lot of blood for one animal. I don't know. Either uh, some kind of clotting agent or they got all the blood out of it. I was talking to, to Shana and uh, Crystal and people over at American Cryptid, their, their Facebook page. Yeah. And... They were they were saying it was probably a chupacabra. Now, if you, if you look up chupacabra, you know, on on Google or whatever, they're going to show you a picture of an old mangy coyote or you know a dog that's got the mange. But they said no, that those, those pictures are misleading because they were telling me about other cases where, you know, they would go in, you know, kill every chicken in the chicken coop with that puncture wound, and you know, they wouldn't make a sound. That's what they, uh, apparently these these sheep did. I mean, they didn't make any noise. There was no ruckus made. They just like went one from one animal to the other and spiked them in the neck and drank their blood, I guess. But anyway, I, I went to the court case. Of course, when they're, when they're talking to the judge, they all speak perfect English at this point. It wasn't like it was. And I was trying to make goat sounds and stuff out there. And trying to... <laughs> Made me mad, man. <laughs> I hate that. Anyway, the, 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 they had brought pictures in of, you know, like the, 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 dead, the, the dead sheep out there in the field. The judge asked him, said, well, did, did, did you see the dog? Oh, yes, yes, we've seen the dog. Uh, did you take, oh, no, we didn't take pictures. Did you try and stop the dog? Oh, no, we didn't try and stop it. And he's like, you don't have any pictures. You didn't try and stop it. You know, the case was dismissed. But I, I was going to tell the judge, had to, you know, but unfortunately the guy, you know, the animal control already picked up his dogs. and He lost his dogs. But he was, you know. He, he wasn't a, a very conscientious dog owner anyway, but, you know, I'd see two dogs get destroyed. Right. Bad owners, not bad dogs, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're just always in the right place at the right time. Or through your life, you've you've had some, or maybe you're just able to recognize it. You know, it's, it, it, it's funny you say that because I've talked to people, and they were like, there are certain people that have kind of, you know, lucked up into this. I don't say lucked up, but they seem to, you know, be the center of this kind of thing. It's like, uh, oh, some of my kinfolk, his name is Jam Williams. This was back years, years ago, long, long before I was born. He was uh, sitting up. Uh, fever was going through West Virginia, and he was sitting up with a, a little toddler. I guess he was the only one in the house. There, basically, he was in one room, and then the bedroom was like through a, open doorway there and that's where the the child was laying in the crib and you know they they they, they knew he, he wasn't going to make it through the night so he got up and he heard a voice saying come and see so he walks to the the doorway and looks in he doesn't go in the room and he said you know he, he cries he, he, he would cry when he told you the story he couldn't he couldn't tell you what, what, what a straight face but he, he you know bring tears to his eyes but he saw the angel of death and he said it was huge. Said its wingtips touched each side of the of the room, which would be a ten by ten room. That means it's it, you know, wingtips would have been longer than that. And then he was tall, and he was all bent over. He said he reached down like into the bassinet. He couldn't see what he was reaching for, and like it cupped up water. And in its in its hand, of course, this you know the angel was glowing, but whatever it was, he cupped up was glowing twice as bright. It just kind of faded away and left. Now, fast forward ahead to 2011, uh, my wife was dying. I had her here at home, and I had her set close to the window where she could see out. She was telling me about the man in white she kept seeing. And when it first started off, well, he was out there by the road. And then, you know, a few days later, well, he was coming up the driveway. The third day, well, he's at the bottom of the stairs and so forth. Well, the day that she died, she had slipped into a coma, and we'd done decided she was going to die at home. She'd done been to the hospital I don't know how many times. They'd patch her up, send her home, to go through all that suffering again. So that was our decision. So the preacher came by, and me and him had kind of talked about it. Like I say, she's, she's fixed to go within an hour. I happened to just glance out the window, and there for a second, I seen, I seen the man in white standing there to what whoa, 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 would be my front stoop, getting ready to come to the door. And, of course, he didn't look angelic. He just looked like, I don't know, uh, 
young John Denver, young Glenn Campbell, somebody like that, in just white clothes, very clean cut, you know, very attractive young man. I seen him for a second. He was gone, but you know, I guess I guess there's angels come in any form, and I guess what, whatever they want you to see is what you see. But. I'm so sorry about your wife. That just breaks my heart. Yeah, she she'd been sick a long time. You know, it's like I don't begrudge death. I know everybody's going to die, but this suffering stuff, I I ain't got no part with that. That's you know, seem like seem like all my family members they they died a long suffering death. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, and you're right. None of us get out of here alive. None of us. But it's hard for a spouse to watch their other spouse kind of waste away and die. But you you hung with her and you loved her and that's uh that's real special. But and you got to experience that and you know with her. So I think that's real interesting. Uh, you know, well, whenever she was telling me about it, and I was thinking, well, you know, she's sick, her brain's not getting the oxygen it should. She's imagining this. She's a little painkiller. Until I seen it for myself. And it's like, you know, all this time, I'm kind of putting it back in my mind that, you know, this is all her imagination, but it wasn't, it was real. That's what I was going to say earlier is like the guy that had the sheep that were killed, you know, somebody could come drive up to my house and say, Hey, there's a, there's a, I don't know. I mean, think of anything, something along those lines, or, you know, we, there's a Bigfoot walking through these woods, come see him. I don't know that I would go. So I think that's the, I mean, I would probably go, man, I don't have time to do that. I got to get to work. That's the difference between probably you and me is it interests you and you'll go check it out. Like you said, you were going to, you spent an hour and a half away from the site wanting to come back and make the cast of that track. And I would have never done that. I don't know if I'm just lazy or (laughs) I just, I think I'll probably just try to expend my energy on things that I know are, that's just kind of the way my mind works, you know, maximize time all the time. Heck, if I, I just hauled in a bunch of groceries about an hour ago and I'm sitting there working my mind out how I can get every one of these Walmart bags up in the house in one trip. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, those things through your life, those things have interested you and you see something to it to where other people wouldn't, which goes to the way that people think about these things. And there's a lot of paranormal type stories out there that probably, you know, I'm an inquisitive person. I guess if I were to meet someone here locally that I could sit down and talk to and get to know them and maybe even experience some of the things they would, I would probably do it. I'm just never in that position. I'm just kind of stuck here behind a microphone in my YouTube life. In my other life, I'm just sitting here working on engineering stuff. So what else is going on? Anything going on recently that you've uh, that you've had an experience with? The most recent thing that's happened here, uh, I guess, was my, my 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 girlfriend. Now she had a little cat. Some strange dogs had come through here and they killed her cat. Well, but, but before we found the cat's body, uh, she went off in the woods with me to call for this cat. She thought the cat was lost in the woods. And normally you couldn't pay her enough money to go in the woods. She just wouldn't do it. She's city gal. She don't want a part of it. But she's out there and she's hollering for the cat. She's hollering for the cat. And then she finds the cat's body the next day, you know, and of course the, the cat's dead. And she makes me give it a funeral. I bury it out there in the yard. She's putting flowers out there and she's booed and crying. And that night, the Bigfoots come and they start leaving her gifts leaving her orange because they, they left her uh, an orange on the hood of her car. How they knew her car, me, anybody else's car, me, tells me they've been watching. They knew exactly who she was, where she was. And they left, they left oranges twice for her. And then the last, the last time they came, they had gotten, you remember them old, uh, blue metal coffee pots, camping sets? Yeah. Yeah. There's somewhere they had found one of them blue, them blue metal coffee pots and they had left that out there for her on the hood of her car. And that was, you know, kind of like, oh, don't cry. You know, we, you know, we feel bad for you. That's the last thing that happened here. Did you say they were bringing her oranges? Yeah, we've got an orange grove probably, oh, about a mile down the road from me. Okay, okay. And they went down there and they they pick they pick oranges and they leave them on the the hood of her car. They did that twice. Twice they left oranges and then and they left the coffee pot. And after that, they didn't leave nothing. I guess they figured she mourned long enough. Three days. Do you live out in a rural rural area? It was a lot more rural whenever I was a kid. It's starting to build up now, but everything out here is cut into 
either five or seven and a half acre tracks out here. Yeah. Okay. And when 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 I first moved out here, uh, I had like two or three neighbors. Now they're they're all around me. Of course, you know about about the closest the houses can get to one another. About three hundred feet from the center, of one at one five acre track to the next. So if you've had recent activities, do you ever do you ever talk to your neighbors about that? Do you get any collaboration with them or similar stories? I've got a young fella there behind us. He decided he'll be in the chicken raising business. And he built a nice big chicken pen, and he got cows, and he got chickens and stuff. Within about a week or two, he had a bunch of chickens disappear. And I found their wings all over my yard in, in, my, in the back of my property. Apparently, that when a Bigfoot takes a chicken, he takes it alive from where he's going, and then when he gets where he'll sit out and eat, that's where he eats them. So I'd find a, a pile of, like, you know, the wing tip part. Right. They just be broke off in a pile here on my property. So I went over there, and I, and in the course of like three months, he lost like 120 chickens. I mean, they were cleaning him out. Of course, he's all the time, well, the raccoons or whatever. And I'm like, buddy, raccoons don't open up chicken pan, go in and get a handful of them, walk out, and then lock the pen behind them. They don't do that. But, you know, I could see right off he wasn't too open to the idea. So I didn't mention it to him. Now I had a, Another fella had his travel trailer here on my property. Well, after the hurricane that happened here in 2005, uh, a lot of people lost everything they owned, houses destroyed and everything. I was one of them. I had power and stuff right out there to my barn, so we put out a bunch of travel trailers. Different people were staying out there. Well, I went out there one evening to see my Uncle Bill, and on top of his trailer was a gargoyle. He wasn't very big. He was probably, I don't know, 16, 17 inches tall. When it took off flight, it, it had wings. It spread its wings, but it never flattened its wings for lip. That's the reason I think that was a demonic entity, feeding off all the negative energy where people had, you know, lost their homes, didn't know what they were going to do. I saw that, and then I saw I saw the, the, the little people one time, too. They were, I got a cow pond out here, and uh, the way the cow pond was dug, they're like a little peninsula that comes out in the side of it, and to the one side of that peninsula, I saw something playing. And at first, I thought it was birds, like little wood ducks or something splashing around. So I come out and ar- around the curve of the peninsula where I could see it. And I could see it was two little people. They were less than 20 inches tall. And their bodies were, uh, they, they didn't have any hair on them. They were brown. They were, uh, you, you got you got grandchildren. So I'm, I'm sure you've seen the, the Disney movie Moana. Yes. Okay, you know the 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 demigod uh, Maui, how he's built. He's almost as broad as he is tall. Yeah, yeah. That 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 was the figure. Of these of these two little people. They were one was male, and one was female, and they were playing air splash, just like kids would splash in the water, splashing one another and stuff. Well, as I I come around to get a really close look at them, but I had to go around this peninsula. And once I come around the peninsula, they were out of my line of sight. By the time I got around it, they were gone. But uh, here in Florida, these cow ponds, they got muck bottoms in them. So the water is somewhere between the shade of iced tea and coffee. It's always black and nasty looking water. Cows don't seem to mind it, but if you go if you go swimming in one, you come out dirtier than when you went in. But the spot, the spot where they were playing, like in about a four-foot circle, that water was so clean, it looked clean enough to drink. I don't know what they'd done to that water where they was playing, but it was just as clean. It looked like, you know, store-bought drinking water in that in that one little spot. When I tried to tell my uncle about those two things and about the little gargoyle, they gave me the stank eye. They didn't believe me of it. So, you know, about, uh, about what, what people will and won't believe. It's you know, just, just like a neighbor behind me. He'd accept anything except that. And, you know, the people down the road, of course, I think I think more of theirs was about money signs. They figured they'd sue and get a bunch of money out of this old guy. But. Well, you said the guy who lost all his chickens, you didn't really you didn't really broach the topic with him, did you? Well, I, 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 I kind of broached it. It's like, you know, he's talking about the raccoons. And I'm like, you know, raccoons don't open up chicken pen, go in there and get a handful of them and close the pen behind them. I, they don't do that. Yeah. Well, I, I, and he's, you know, trying to think of everything and, you know, I could I could see he wasn't open to it. It's like uh, I had a uh, another fellow brought a travel trailer over here to be fixed. I 
he used to do some elect, uh, 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 electronic repair, and his uh, his power inverter had burned out on it. So he brought it over here for me to fix the power inverter. And the first night, you know, the Sasquatches, they're smart. They, 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 they recognize things. They know that usually where there's a travel train there, there's campers. Where there's campers, there's, you know, coolers full of goodies and picnic lunches and stuff. So I had it parked over there, and on the front, they had the gas bottles. And they had a cover over top of it. And I'm listening, and I'm hearing him over there. And he's trying to lift that cover, see if there's food or anything that cover. Jiggling them gas bottles and stuff. It was dark. I didn't shine a light over there. I, I, I've learned that you shine a light, and they disappear quick. But, yeah, I can go out there. Just about – they make a circuit here. About every two weeks, they'll show up for three or four days, and they're going about their, you know, about their circuit. I don't, I don't know how big their territory is, but – you know, I imagine that up in the northern climates that, you know, when they, they, they kind of follow the seasons, like, uh, well, like in that, that Faye story, they talk about, uh, about the wood folk, about how they, 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 they would leave the area when the leaves turn. They go deeper back in the mountains. Well, here in Florida, we, you know, we don't have any, we, we've only got two, two seasons here, underwater and on fire. We don't have any <laughs> snow or anything to talk about. So I think they just make a, they just make circuits. Like I say, I can I can almost climb it, and if I sit out there on my back stoop, you know, when they're in town I, or in the area, you can hear the the the, the, the big owl who sound like a four hundred pound owl out there. Hoo, hoo. You hear a knock and response. You know, if you listen real close, you can hear them. Like there's a a tree line about maybe one hundred twenty feet from my place. You can hear them walk along that tree line. Then you know they're watching the house. Sometimes late at night, long about two, three o'clock in the morning, you'll hear them pat inside the house. They pat it up high. So I, I, live, I live in a manufactured home, so the pat where they're patting, they've got to be able to reach up, you know, eight, nine, ten feet. They'll smack inside the house, that kind of thing. I had well, I had a, a, a small X in the backyard. I met some juveniles that built it. And I left it up there for a while. And finally, one day, I was out doing something in the yard. Uh, the X is made out of two small maple trees. They were probably about as big around as your wrist. They weren't very big. They were just pulled up out of the ground and made an X. One with the roots up, one with the roots down, made an X out of it. So I burned that X. Oh, man, I made them mad with that. The next night, they egged the back of my, my house with bird eggs. What? Yeah, they took like, about, about four or five different types of birds. I don't know where all they got the eggs from and just splattered the back of my house with them. They probably thought, 10 or 12 eggs back side of my house. If they, hey, you know, that, that was our ex. They get mischievous, don't they? Well, you know, you know that's that's probably a, uh, a pretty big food source for them. So I imagine they got quite a bit. Of trouble. I imagine the juvenile built that egg. They probably got in trouble with that. I don't know. Like that, uh, that little one I had out here in the front yard, uh, I had poured a, a driveway, concrete driveway, up to the house with the road because my gal friend, she was talking about tracking this dirt house. So we poured that driveway. Well, when it was new, it was pretty slick. We had a little rainstorm. And then I was looking out there, and the concrete was wet. And there was a little one. He was probably about the size of a toddler, about a two- or three-year-old. And he would run and skid across like, like he was ice skating on that slick concrete. I imagine he got into trouble for that, too. They, they ain't supposed to be seen. And I watched him for two or three minutes after ice skating. You know, it's like, you know, I, I wanted to film him, but by the time you walk out there with a the camera, he's gone anyway. So, oh, yeah. You know, like, I, I've, I, I've had a lot of people ask, well, you know, well, why don't you put up trail cams? Why don't you? The minute you do that, they they, they, they stop interacting with you. They won't, you know, it's like it's like you're, you're warding them off. They don't want to interact with you. I know I had, I had put out marbles and things like that. And, you know, they'd take the marbles or they'd move them. I got a... Like I'll, I'll take, I'll stick a shovel in the ground, or you know, I, I, I carry a machete. I will stick a machete in a certain fence post, and go out there the next day, and it's been moved, stuck it to another fence post. So the shovel's been, it was leaning uh, head down, it'd be turned up, head up, that kind of. Thing. But all this activity around your house, and m- maybe you're not close to all your neighbors. I'm not. I, I've got people who live all around me. I don't even know who they are, and uh, I, I should. But I'm so busy, I don't. I just don't have time to go meet. I know some of them, but my question is, you don't have anybody there that sees these things like you do, or can share stories like you do. With, you know, amongst yourselves. 
I know people that have seen things, but trying to get them to talk about it, it's like trying to pull teeth. You know, it's like uh, I know, like like some of the some, some of the people I've I've talked to. You know, it's like I've got uh, I've got some neighbors down the road, and their property backs up into a, a bigger pasture field. So there's probably forty acres in that block, and you know, there's there's really nothing on. And, you know, they'll see something, you know, running across the back or whatever, but, you know, they won't, they won't call it by name. You know, I see something run across there or what it looked like. Well, it, it, it kind of looked like a man. It wasn't a big, well, I'm not saying that, but yeah, they, they, they see stuff. They just don't want to talk about it. They won't give it a name. And then you've got other people out here that, you know, if, if, if what they say is true, it's like, uh, I've had a few guys tell me that, you know, they've seen, you know, the dog man, you know, they like, I, I know, I know one guy told me he went up to the Okie Finoki up in Northern Florida. He went up there to bear hunt and he said, he seen, he seen the dog man up there. But again, these are the same guys that I've been hunting with, that, you know, would kill a, a, a little two point buck. And by the time you know, they told the story, it was, you know, world record 12 pointer kind of thing. So I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> I know. I know if you like that. I wanted to say a couple of things or give you a chance to talk about. It. Now, you've sent me a couple of stories. One was the, the Mackies and the Fay, and the other the other was uh, about the uh, Rattlesnake Cannery and Harold Keene, and it was – I love that story. That was so good. But you, uh, you have so many that you've written and you've sent them out to other people. Talk about talk about some of the other channels you've sent them, sent the stories to. Yeah, I story. still want to uh... – um, American cryptid one time about a story that was told to me by uh, a fellow named A.J. Bullock. He was a, he run a sawmill down here. I worked for him for a while whenever I was fresh out of high school. One of the best jobs I ever had out in the sun. And, you know, we were out there cutting down trees, cutting, you know, cutting, cutting timber into lumber. But he told me, of course, he, he didn't believe in the Bigfoot, but he told me about a claim that he had gotten there and, uh, outside of his home in Purvis, Mississippi. Uh, it was, you know, a bunch of old growth timber and stuff that he got the claim for. And he said the guy, either, the guy either didn't know what it was worth or, he, you know, he just didn't care. So he got it like at rock bottom price. So he went in there to stake his claim. And uh, the first day they went in there and there was trees dragged across the, the road. So they had to spend a day cutting the trees out. They finally got, you know, the sawyers down there were cutting and, you know, they were getting rocks thrown at them. They got uh, one guy got his nose broke. Somebody chunked a uh, chunk of wood at him. Then he right in the face and busted his nose. That stuff was was messed with. They had a a little. He described it like a like a like a D three dozer. It's a it's a small track machine that they use for a skitter to pull uh, logs out of the uh, out of the woods with. And something had pushed it sideways and not knocked the track off of it. And, of course, by now, he's thinking that, you know, somebody wants to jump his claim and cut this timber, and they wasn't going to run him off. You know, he had, you had guys quitting every day because they, you know, they get scared of being rock snowed at them. And, of course, that one boy had his nose broke. You know, he, he even told him, said, I ain't coming back. Said, there's boogers in them wood. Of course, you know, they, AJ, AJ, AJ always thought it was, you know, somebody trying to sabotage his operation. But the last time he went out there, uh, he went out there, you know, with guns and stuff. He went out there early in the morning thinking he's going to catch these people out there messing around. And, you know, he had a drum, a drum of diesel fuel was up and didn't turn over. I mean, stuff that he would take that, well, like, 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 like that, uh, like that skitter that got turned sideways. You know, a farm tractor would move it, but a human being couldn't move that thing. Push it sideways like, like, like it was pushed. And like the, 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 the diesel drums, they had their fuel in. You know, if a uh, 55 gallon drum of uh, diesel fuel is a pretty heavy thing to pick up and throw. So, you know, they, they, they limped up out of there. Now, I checked on the, on the Google Earth where that piece of ground was. They, ne- they no, Nobody never did cut that piece of ground. Really? You know, it's like, so yeah, those trees are still there looking at Google Earth. And there, didn't nobody ever come in there. And, you know, so, so sawmilling is a, a big part of the, the livelihood in Louisiana and, and Mississippi, especially that old growth timber. You're talking about, you know, pine trees that two men can't reach around. Right. You know, prime prime stuff. But didn't nobody ever cut that. I don't know if they all got scared out or what the deal was. We just had a guy clear cut a 40 acre track right next to me. <clears throat> and, I, and I went out there and talked to him. And of course, I had to ask him, I said, y'all ever 
getting way back here in these woods and stuff. Do y'all ever see anything strange? He goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, we see some weird stuff. And I said, anything about Bigfoot? And he goes, I'll tell you about that sometime if I run into you at the restaurant, but I got to get back to work now. So I've already, he was telling me, I think these, the, but the point is these guys that work in the timber industry, I think they run into that stuff a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they do. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just like hunters. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know what the guys that, you know, that don't even believe will go out and, and, and they'll go hunting and they'll be in, you know, in the middle of field, field dressing a deer or whatever. And come back, and you know their kill is gone, or they'll shoot one, they'll see a drop, and before they can get to it, it's gone, it disappeared, and, and it's it's close by. I mean, everybody's got this idea you got to be in the woods to see them. I think that they're a whole lot closer than people think. It's just like in in, in my little area here, it's like yeah, you know, there's there's deers here, there's there's hog here, you know, there's there's plenty for them to eat. You know, a, a lot of this place is like cleared off pasture land and stuff. Every once in a while, the Bigfoot will take it upon himself that he's going to kill some coyotes. I don't know why. At first, I thought that maybe they did it, you know, to appease the ranchers. Well, if the coyote, you know, if they come in here trying to kill coyotes, they might find us. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a rite of passage. I don't know. Maybe, maybe when a young Bigfoot decides he's a man now, he's going to go out and kill the largest predator he can come across. But that night, I heard him killing them coyotes. And the most ungodly thing you ever want to hear, them animals jiving and screaming. They had went into, I guess, a whole pack of them, and they just, like, grabbed them up by the leg or by the tail, just beat their bodies against the ground. And then they laid them out like they were, you know, they were on show. The next morning when I got down there, there was eight of them laid out in a row, and their bones were broken and skulls cracked in, and you could see spots in the ground where they just, you know, they just beat them on the ground. I don't know if they were hitting them with clubs or what, but it was like, you know, a big show thing. And, and I've been in spots, too, like on farther down the road, where you'll find three or four of them hanging on a barbed wire fence. It's like, you know, this is a sign. You know, look, look at look at how big and bad I am. I killed these, these eight coyotes, you know, with nothing but a stick. That kind of thing. Do you think it's a competition thing? Competition for food, maybe? I, I don't think so, because, I mean, they really aren't the same class. I mean, it's like, well, you take, you, 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 you take a Bigfoot down here. And I have I have run in I have run into this I've actually seen the the aftermath of it. They'll take and they'll pull up a young pine tree that's probably eight or ten feet long, strip the branches off of it. They'll run out into a herd of hogs, and they'll start swiping them, and they'll smack and break their legs. You, you cripple up many, many of them as possible, and then go back. It's like it's like keeping fish in a live well. There'd be all these crippled hogs out there, and they'll go back. And, you know, kill them as they need them kind of thing. I've known guys that'll run up onto a, a herd of hogs and, 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 you know, maybe eight of them got, got, got their front legs broke. And they're all, you know, just kind of wallowing out there, you know, waiting for whatever it is to come back and get them. And, they, and they're smart, too. It's like, you know, a lot of people out here, they hog hunt from a, from a swamp buggy. And they'll be out there on the buggy and they'll be out hog hunting and they'll be going down the track. Well, the Bigfoot are smart. They'll get off to the side of the track. And they'll find a spot, you know, like a choke point where these hogs can make a break and, you know, can go through a spot where that buggy can't go. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's where they'll be waiting. They'll be waiting right there at that choke point and just club them up some hogs and clean yeah. them out. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think you're right. I don't think Coyote and the Bigfoot are on the same class. Coyotes eat small game. They don't eat. You know, one of the big fallacies is that coyotes are – killing deer by the thousands they're not they'll take a phone but they unless it's a pack of them they can't take down a full-grown deer one of them can't and so yeah i doubt it's competition that's interesting well like i said we're coming up past an hour you uh we talked about so many things before we uh got on the air here and is there anything we left out you wanted to talk about i don't know cam there's many of them i could come up with the, 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 the one thing that, that got me the most, I guess, is whenever you come to an area or, or, or a story where you've got people that have actually seen it, you know, have actually gone through it, and then to hear them retell it. I mean, it's just, it's just like 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 me trying to talk some of this stuff. There's so many things you can't explain, you know, and then you go to a, a chat room and you say, well, this is what I've seen. What could it be? You've got some people got got so many different ideas about it, be it ghosts or 
chupacabras or whatever it is. Yeah. So, but whenever I get a story from somebody, it's like it's like the the, the story I got I got about King that was told to me by some of the Johnson. You know, they're they're an old fam, family here, and I vet these stories. You know, I I go back and I look. Well, this, this is where it happened, and 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 you know, this is where the house would have been. And, and, you know, you met it on Google Earth. Well, that's six miles, and it's you know, and he, the, there's the cannery, and yes, here's a, here, here's the old clippings where he was advertising that you know live snakes are worth more than the dead snakes, and so you try and vet all this stuff before you before you present it. But I like the the, the story of the fact. In my mind, it was all wives' tales till I seen until I seen him and started, and it's like, man, that's this this had to have been real, right? It is, you know. Dave is just a wealth of information on not just Bigfoot, but the story about the guy from the mental institution was is fascinating. Whatever happened to that guy? Did he just fade away? Did they release him? What happened? Did he go to prison? No, that, that, that's the thing. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't have caught him if the guy hadn't had a silent alarm. And when he, when he left us, there was no sign of escape. I've got no idea how he got out of that building. You know, we're we're a, a security mental institution. You got to have a key to get in and get out. So how he got out with nobody seeing him? You know, where did he go from there? Because it was kind of out, you know, in the middle of nowhere. If he had, uh, if he had somehow contacted somebody prearranged to be picked up or what, you know, and and when they picked him up, he had no ID. He didn't have no money. He didn't have none of that when he left. I don't know. Of course, there ain't no telling. He may have stashes buried here and there with fake IDs and money and everything else. Ain't no telling. That is the makings of a novel, if you ask me. I mean, that's a 80,000 word novel. You could do a, somebody could take that idea and just run with it and keep all the facts in there and then expound on the, on what he did after he, after he left. And did you say that was in 2011? No, that was much earlier than that, wasn't it? Yeah, that would have been what about 87 or 88, I believe. Okay. Was he a young guy then? No, he was, like I say, he was probably, of course, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. Like I say, he had one of them faces like Denzel Washington. He could have been 50 or he could have been, you know, 30 or anywhere in between. Right. Very clean cut. It's like, you know, I, I, here we are in a mental institution and you have a patient who's acting out. I mean, they're, they're fixed to get physical and violent. And I've seen him just look at him and say, now you settle down now. And they just go quiet. <laughs> You know, it's like it's like you know you have you have an institution like that. You have bullies. You know why bully him? They didn't get close to him. They were just you. You could see it's like if he came walking down the hallway. And of course, you know he was very humble. You know, like did you did, did you ever see the 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 book of Eli? Yes. Okay. This is that's the kind of guy he reminded you of. Okay. He was just very humble, very clean cut. But you can imagine that at any time that he would get you some kind of chop sake to just knock you out. Uh, that's the way the people treated him. It's like, you know, even the even the big craze guys that would reach out and grab a, a staff member and try and choke him, they gave him a wide berth. They walked down the hallway with him. <laughs> they, were, they 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 knew he wasn't the guy to be messed with. I'm laughing. It's not funny, but that's kind of my response to just things that just blow me away. All right, Dave, I think we're going to wind this up. We're past an hour. It's going to be my longest interview, but it's worth every minute of it, I think. I wanted to thank you very much for being willing to come on. You're you're such an interesting guy, such a good writer, and thank you. That's about all I can say. You're such a great host. It's been my pleasure, bud. <laughs> I'm horrible at this, but anyway, it's fun to talk to you. Listen, everybody, thanks for watching the video. I guess we'll see you guys on the next one. Thank you.